What's going on, YouTube? Art App Dan here, Federal Prison Time Consulting. Happy Thursday to everybody. So uh, we've got a new internet connection, so you guys let me know how the audio and video and whatnot is. We are going to be talking today about the stresses of getting ready to go into the prison system. Uh, the nightmare has become real for a lot of you that you are facing a prison sentence. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to give everybody a few minutes to join. Um, if you haven't already done so, please take this opportunity to subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're almost at, uh, I think we're getting close to 10,000 subscribers somewhere in that neighborhood, which is you know great for this type of a channel. And don't forget to give a thumbs up, like the video, share the video, all that good stuff. Also, uh, just a little side note, for those of you later on today, around 4.30 p.m., we're going to be going live again. And uh, I did a video a while back, a couple years ago in 2000, I think it was 2017 or 18. We did a video on a con artist, this guy by the name of uh, Charlie Castro Barbero. Some of you may have remembered him. Uh, we did a video on this guy. Uh, this is going to be, this is a new video that we're going to be doing today at 4.30, a live video. This guy is still active. He's still out there conning people, scamming people. He's the one that was in prison trying to scam me to... Basically, he was trying to defraud me out of thousands of dollars, and he was running this con while he was in federal prison. We contacted the prison. They didn't do anything about it. We contacted the prosecutor that actually prosecuted his case for why he was in prison for exactly the same thing he was trying and attempting to do to me. And <clears throat> after that video uh, going live, almost every month, or I would get a, a, some sort of a text message or an email from somebody that this guy had taken advantage of doing similar cons. So we're going to be talking about this. If you want to catch this video, you can, uh, you'll can. you see it come up live or here, I'll post the link in the description of, the, of this live chat right here that we're on now. And you guys can go ahead and set a reminder to catch this. This should be a fun video because we're trying to knock this guy off his pedestal. But yeah, we're going to be doing a video on that. Um, but yeah, today we're going to be talking about things that matter for those of you that are either under federal indictment or you're, you're under a target letter or you've already been indicted, you're getting ready to maybe get sentenced, and you're going through a lot of the trauma in our minds of, I can't believe this is happening to me. Uh, many of you feel like there's probably nobody that really understands what you're going through. Maybe you're talking to your attorney and you've got more questions and answers. Uh, this is, I'm not here to give legal advice. I'm here to tell you what has worked for me and what has worked for many other individuals that are in a similar situation to you. Um, <clears throat> say hi to a couple of you that are in the room. Uh, Vince, how are you doing? What's going on, Juan? You know, we've got uh, Vince over here. Awesome topic. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We got Juan L. in the room. Uh, Juan is one of our one of our longtime clients, and if any of you are maybe going to be going to Lompoc or have, or I'm sorry, Yankton, have questions about Yankton and you want some answers, uh, Juan is more than willing to answer. Just go ahead and post your comments in there. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, guys. And also, if you have any interest in our, any of our services, as you know, we do prison consulting services, and a lot of this ties into what many of you are going to need. Uh, you can head over to our website over at federalprisontime.com. Uh, all the links are in the description of this video as well. So if, if you're not copying this stuff right now, you can catch this on the replay. Uh, the links are in the description. There's a free consultation link, which I highly suggest you take advantage of if you're in this situation right now and you're not really sure what you should be doing. Uh, this is a perfect opportunity for you to speak to somebody that's been through it. Maybe there's some services that we have to offer that can cater to your specific needs, helping you kind of figure out this journey. And if not, you might just get some free information that could help you have a little bit easier of a day. So let's talk about it a little bit. If you're under indictment right now, chances are you've probably, for a lot of you, you've never been in any type of real trouble before. Uh, you never imagined that going to prison was going to be something that was going to be within a possibility of your future. Maybe you've got children, you're married, you've got elderly parents at home. Any of these things can create such anxiety. And a, when I say restlessness, I'm talking sleepless nights and tossing and turning and staring at the ceiling, feeling like your life is absolutely over. Um, if you are feeling suicidal and you're feeling like there's, there's going to be absolutely no end to this and you just can't cope, please reach out to somebody. If not me, reach out. There's many hotlines. You can go online and Google you know, suicide hotlines. Talk to somebody. Don't try to manage this on your own. Um, I can promise you one thing for at least most of you anyway. 
most of you that are going through this process right now, I can promise you that uh, chances are what you're going through right now in the pretrial phase, waiting for the next step, waiting for your prison sentence, waiting for the journey to really start, this is probably going to be the worst thing that you're going to deal with, what you're dealing with right now. Uh, for most of us that go through this, prison really is not the hardest thing. Uh, the thought of prison is absolutely the hardest thing. But for most of you that are you know, first-time, nonviolent, white-collar types of individuals, prison's not going to be the end of the world, especially if you properly prepare both mentally, physically, getting your ducks in order, understanding what you could be doing right now that could really uh, potentially change the outcome of what a sentencing hearing might look like for you. Many of you think, well, the guidelines are the guidelines. There's nothing anybody can do that's going to change the guidelines. You know, and you hear this, you hear this from attorneys as well. And you also hear this from people that have been through it that think consulting is complete, complete bullshit. Well, I can tell you that um, guidelines are advisory unless you have a mandatory minimum, you know, something that's carrying a minimum mandatory. Obviously, there's nothing that can be done about that. And even in that case, that's not necessarily true. There's things that you can do, uh, different levels of cooperation, there's safety valves that can, you know, remove minimum mandatories. And these are all things that, you know, we can talk about during a free consultation, which you can, again, look in the description of this video. There's a link on there for the free consultation. I also posted it in the live chat, so you can just copy the link from there. Um, but if you have advisory guidelines and you're looking at a guideline range, and let's say your offense level is, I don't know, level 15, a level 20, a level 30, whatever it might be, those advisory guidelines means these are recommended guidelines that the judge is to take under advisement um, based on the standards of sentencing doesn't necessarily mean this is what you're going to be sentenced to. Uh, the judge does have the ability to go below the guidelines or above the guidelines. And in most cases, if you are, you know, not dragging them through the mud and you're doing some level of cooperation and taking uh, acceptance of responsibility, usually you'll see a departure and you'll see the judge sentenced to somewhere to the low end of the guidelines, to the mid range level of the guidelines. And what we've seen with many of our clients putting them through the work that we do We've seen many of our clients being sentenced below the guideline range, if not to like a combination of probation, home confinement, um, especially now with COVID <coughs> getting over another cold, guys, especially now as we see COVID ramping through the system and we see this variant of the Delta variant, which is, you know, kind of spiking up again. We're starting to see a lot of cities and states re-implementing wearing the masks. And, you know, even if you even if you've had your vaccines state of Washington is now uh, the governor Sinley or what's his name? Uh, Ensley or whatever his name is over there is now implemented that everybody like in the hospital, uh, nursing hospital, anybody that's in that industry all now must be vaccinated in order to, to maintain their job. So we're starting to see a lot of things implementing through the system. So COVID is creating some additional issues, which could help you guys with, you know, either better sentencing or things like, you know, if you're looking to do a modification to, to reduce your sentence, if you're looking for things such as compassionate release, uh, these are all topics that we can discuss with you to see if it's something that there is a possibility that you could qualify for this. But most importantly, getting your mind wrapped around that this isn't just going to go away on its own. Um, and yes, this probably is your worst nightmare. Absolutely come true. You know, I can't remember as a child, you know, being afraid of things much more than the idea of, of going to prison and being locked up, uh, especially when you see the horror TV shows and the movies and, you know, the fear of being <clears throat> shanked or attacked or extorted. These are all real fears that we have. But the reality is for most of us where we're going to potentially go, these aren't going to be issues that you're necessarily going to be dealing with. So if you stop worrying about the idea that you might go to prison and start worrying about what you can do right now and here in present day and time to mitigate your circumstances, talking about the personal narratives, character reference letters, Properly prepping for your pre-sentence report, guys. When you get ready to do that interview with U.S. probation, which typically takes place after you plead guilty in front of the judge, you'll have a PSI interview or a pre-sentence investigation where you'll be interviewed by U.S. probation where they're going to go through you know, a million different questions at mock speed. They fly through these questions. They ask you questions. You give them quick answers. And based on this Q&A session with U.S. probation, an entire background report is generated on who you are, what you did, and what type of sentence they think the judge should impose. So the more prepared you are when you walk into this environment, 
uh, if you have your personal narrative locked and loaded and you actually understand what should go into a personal narrative versus what you think should go into a personal narrative can be two different, very, uh, two very different things. You really need to understand what a personal narrative should entail. Many people will have these letters written. They think they're amazing because it talks about all the glorification of what you've done. You know, you, you go to church, you, you help out the youth group you are maintaining a job, you're so sorry for what you did, and you're really this good person who's got, you know, you're the little league coach on your your kid's football team or baseball team, and you perform all of these active duties in your community, and you think these are going to be the things that are going to mitigate what you've done and give the judge a reason to go, oh, you're not a bad guy, I'm not going to send you to prison. Well, it's very important to understand and remember if you don't already know this or it's tucked way back in your memory because you don't want to think about it, the judge has sentenced people just like you that are good people, that are not bad people, that have made mistakes to prison several times before you for very similar types of crimes that you may have been part of. Now, the problem with that is, is you're going to go through this and you, a lot of us tend to compare ourselves to, I didn't murder anybody, I didn't kill anybody, I didn't rape anybody. The judge is going to see that I'm a good person and the universe is going to correct itself. They're not going to send me to prison. Um, they're going to see that my kids need me, my wife needs me. And these are things that we put in our letters that sending me to prison is going to really you know, cause more harm than good because I'm the sole provider for my family. Well, it, it doesn't matter because in a lot of cases, the judge's immediate response to that is, well, why weren't you thinking about that when you committed your crime? Now, I know a lot of you uh, are, are also saying right now, well, you know, I didn't necessarily do what they said I did. However, you signed a plea deal saying you did do what they said you did. So once you sign that plea deal, you got both feet in. You can't you can't go back and forth. The judge isn't going to see it that way. You're guilty of the crime that you pled guilty to. So you have to accept that. And being able to explain the underlying factors of accountability beyond just the acceptance of responsibility to get a downward departure on your guideline range, conveying to this judge that you truly are sorry for what you've done and you've identified your victims, which go far beyond the people that were actually victimized, but we're talking about friends and family, your children, your wives, your husbands, your mothers, fathers, best friends, sisters, uncles, all these people. These become victims of your crime as well because they're going through this with you. And this is extremely stressful for those individuals as well because they typically haven't dealt with this before. They don't know what they should be telling you. They feel sympathetic. They feel sorry. But at the same time, they can't do anything to change it. So they're kind of watching you die slowly as you live in this land of misery. Uh, so yes, you've created victims out of the people closest to you. So when we start assisting you with personal narratives and reference letters, this is kind of the, the track that we want to stick to. And this is why we've created a, a master questionnaire that we have for your loved ones that they fill out. And based on their answers, we go in and start helping and crafting with the reference letters. And then we have one for you as well, the, the individual that's facing the music, right? We have a questionnaire that you fill out specifically. And based on your answers, we can go in and start helping you craft your personal narrative. Uh, this is to help you stay on course for what really matters and not go too far off in a direction of trying to escape the blame or play the victim or, or sound like the hero, like you're just this good person that made this poor mistake and you shouldn't face any prison time at all. Uh, that may be the reality, and that is what we want to see happen for you. We don't want to see you go to prison, but we know if you go in directly with that mentality that it's it's been seen a million times before you, and it's likely just to get shut down. It's not going to serve you any real value, and the letter becomes worthless. And this is why attorneys, I wish that they put more <clears throat> value and thought and starting the process sooner when helping you and drafting you and telling you what you should be doing with your personal narratives and your reference letters, instead of waiting kind of until the last minute and saying, hey, we need you to get some letters from friends and family and have them turned in. Um, <clears throat> we see people turn in 15, 20, 30 letters. And you know, in my opinion, is a judge going to read 30 letters? I don't personally think so. Maybe the judge does take the time to read every single letter. I'm sure the judge is going to say they read every single letter, but we're dealing with human beings who tend to lie. So to think that a judge is above lying or, you know, skating through it, um, I think we'd be a little, uh, you know, self-absorbed there. And it's, it's kind of a little ironic to think that. Uh, now, if we jump with the with the average and the more common practical denominator here that maybe they don't read them all. So why don't we, instead of getting 15, 20, 30 letters, why don't we focus on three or four very strong character references that are well-focused, well-directed in, in, in the sense of not telling you what to say, 
but showing you the areas that are important that can actually make a difference. So we, we kind of stay away from all of the waste of the letter. Uh, this can have a huge impact at sentencing because it's demonstrating to the judge that, A, you're not wasting the court's time, you're not sitting there playing the victim card on this, and the friends and family that are supporting you are holding you accountable. They're not just saying what they think the court wants to hear. They're actually maybe coming down on you a little bit and identifying how this has affected their life in a negative aspect, but segueing into why they are positively standing behind you because of the changes in the, the, the mode that you're going into right now really illustrating accountability, not blaming anybody else, owning this to the to the full and creating an actionable process of showing what you're doing between now and sentencing. You don't just want to show up at sentencing and talk about all these good things you're going to do. It's better to show up at sentencing and show what you've done to change, create new habits, create new attitudes from who you were to who you are to who you're going to be. And if you can really show this and illustrate this properly, you can and sometimes convey to a judge and prove to a judge that you have learned from this, you have dealt with the consequences, and you are creating new habits. And this can tell a judge that maybe you're not the type of person that deserves a lengthy sentence or a sentence at all. In some cases, this can create the possibility of probation and uh, or a combination of probation and house arrest. Um, praise music, what's going on? Lewis, how are you doing? Kevin, what's going on, my man? Uh, Cheyenne, how are you? Welcome, welcome, guys. Thanks for joining us. We got a nice little group in the room with us today. Um, have you heard of the CASA program? Uh, yes, Cheyenne, I have heard of that. And uh, this is something we can discuss, probably not today because it's a whole other topic. But for those of you that want to Google it, it's CASA program. You can Google that in uh, FBOP. Um, <clears throat> so again, now we talk about the personal narrative. I mean, I'm sorry, the, uh, the pre-sentence report. This is probably one of the most important things that you're going to be doing is the PSI, the investigation. This is what dictates whether or not you could potentially have the qualifications for RDAP or not. Now, we all know RDAP is determined at the BOP level. Once you get there, you're going to meet with either prison psychologist or an RDAP coordinator, which is also a psychologist of the prison. They're the ones that ultimately determine whether or not that you need the program or can qualify for the program or get time off for the program. But it all starts with the interview process in the pre-sentence report. So when you start talking to your judge about, you know, wanting to or talking to your attorney about wanting to make sure you have all the information in your PSI or your PSR, and they're going to go, oh, don't worry about that. The BOP makes that decision. That's up to the prison itself. Well, yes, it is. But if the information is not in the PSR, then it's very unlikely that the that the the, uh, the RDAP coordinator at the prison will even consider you because you don't have any of the verifiable information within the document that they're going to look at, which is your PSI, your pre-sentence investigation. Now, that doesn't mean when I say verifiable, that doesn't mean you have to have documented history from the past that you have substance abuse or alcohol issues. It just means that you need to openly discuss it during the interview process with probation, going through the timelines prior to the to the incident, prior to the uh, the arrest of the instant offense. Um, these are all things that need to be documented properly in there with a the timeline. Sometimes a probation officer will skip right over this and they'll ask you, you know, do you have a substance abuse problem? Yes. Well, maybe they don't ask you the dates or when it started. If that stuff is not properly documented in there, then you could technically be denied due to a technicality where you really do need the help. By no means are we telling any of you that you should lie or mislead or make up things that don't exist. We've all seen what happened to other consultants like RDAP law consultants. Uh, if you Google RDAP law consultants, you'll see these guys were indicted for intentionally telling individuals like you to lie about substance abuse problems, creating false documents, showing up to the prison on certain drugs that give the give the look alike of having withdrawals. This is basically scamming the system and it's creating fraud. It's also potentially taking an RDAP seat away from somebody else that really needs it because you filled that spot when somebody else who truly has the issues could have taken advantage of that spot to get the help. So our job here is not to teach you how to manipulate and lie through the system. My job is to make sure that you understand how important it is to be forthcoming and honest. So many people that should have qualified for RDAP didn't qualify for RDAP because they were embarrassed or ashamed and thought by opening up to probation and talking about it could somehow get them in more trouble or make them look bad or cause them to no longer be on pretrial a release where they're waiting and they get rep remanded right there and, and taken into custody. Now they have to sit and wait. The attorney didn't properly go over this with them or didn't explain it to them. 
Um, and there was just a lack of misinformation that created this, this misdial down the road where now you don't, A, you're not going to get the help you need. You're definitely not going to shorten your sentence. And you kind of have this bitter taste in your mouth, wishing that my attorney should have did this. My attorney should have done that. Well, you're the one that's in the driver's seat. No one's going to fight harder for your situation than you. And the only thing that you can really do right now is absorb information, research, 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 your attorney's job, our job, anybody's job that's giving you information. Our job is to provide you with information. Your job is to chew up the meat and spit out the bones and determine what is valuable to you. What information am I providing that, that means something to you that is going to help your process? The worst thing in the world is laying in prison and staring at your cell or your bunk or, you know, sitting out in the rec yard thinking to yourself, fuck, what if I had done this? You know, you don't want to go to prison asking yourself, what could I have done differently to have a better outcome? Um, you want to be able to go to prison if you're going to go to prison and know that you've done everything within your power to create the best possible outcome. And things that you can do are realizing that you need the help of others sometimes to put yourself in that situation to create the best possible outcome. One of the biggest roadblocks we deal with is thinking, I don't need anybody else's help to solve my own problems. That's a big thing. Nobody likes to ask for help. Um, asking for help can be huge. Now, you've got to be able to read between the lines because there's plenty of people out there, a lot of prison consultants. You know, we heard of this guy, Edward Bales and RDAP Law Consultants and some of these other these kookamires that are out there that tell you everything you want to hear. And it's always, oh, yes, we can do that. Yes, we can guarantee designation assistance. Yes, we can guarantee compassionate release. Yes, we can guarantee RDAP. Yes, we can guarantee you're not going to go to prison. And you're going to, you're going to receive, you know, probation or home confinement. You need to run from those type of certainties. Anybody that's giving you a guarantee is, in, in my opinion, <clears throat> unless the guarantee is we're going to do everything we can to put you in the best possible situation. And that best possible outcome might mean prison, might mean a shorter sentence, it might mean within the guidelines, it might mean probation, we don't know. But we know that if we overturn every single stone and we put effort in every little different aspect that can make a difference, even if it's a small difference, even if it ends up getting you a shorter sentence by 10%, 20%, 30%, that's that much less time you're going to be spending in prison and that much faster you're back with your family producing again, getting back out, getting back into the workforce and understanding that all of this starts now. This giant game of chess doesn't all happen at the last minute. You've got to start putting in the momentum, start preparing for your release today. Your release from prison doesn't start once you get there, once you get close to an outdate. Your release and preparation for how you're going to reintegrate back into society should be starting right now and understanding what steps are in front of you so you have a clear roadmap to success in what you can do to navigate to create that best possible outcome. And that's what we do. That's why we have the website. That's why we have the YouTube channel. Again, uh, we'll take a peep over here. You know, we like to show off RDAP Dan's website, right? So it's so these are some of the things we help with. Sentence reduction assistance, pre-sentence interview. Let's talk about the, uh, the, the, the PSR. Mindset and coaching. We work with you on creating a positive mindset, giving you ideas of what you can do, with how you can get involved in your community. And getting involved in your community now in the aspect of, of giving back, whether it be community service, these things can create an aspect of showing the judge that you're taking a positive stance in this. And But you don't want to just be run-of-the-mill community service. You don't want to, I'm not going to say going to a soup kitchen and helping the homeless is not something that's very, very stand up to do, but it's not really practicing humility in explaining what you've done. You know, we can find things that you can do where you're maybe speaking to small groups, talking about the mistakes that you made, how you didn't, how you avoided the red flags, how you could have made better choices and talking to either your youth or students not only are you sharing your story and making a change and giving back to the community, you might be preventing somebody from making the same mistake as you. Your success story, uh, your cautionary tale could be something that somebody else holds on to later in life when they're given the opportunity to do something in a gray area. They might remember back, I remember when Dan gave that little speech and I remember those three words he said. That could be all the difference it takes to stop somebody from making the same mistake that you made. And if you do this, you'll start to feel the positivity that comes from it. And then illustrating this and articulating this to a court, to a judge and what you've done, you know, now you're showing community service and you're also showing that you've involved yourself, engaged yourself with youth and maybe stopping somebody else from doing the same thing. These are 
some of the catalysts that we've seen give judges a reason not to want to send somebody to prison. So again, all of this combined can create a pretty strong force that most of you probably won't do on your own. And 99% of the time, it's not something your attorney is really going to be uh, talking about too much, whether it's a paid attorney or an appointed attorney. It's just not what they focus on. It's not in their their wheelhouse. You know, this is something that you get from from an expert area, and that's where a service like ours comes in play. So definitely hop over to the website, uh, federalprisontime.com, guys. Um, checking some questions here. Cheyenne, I would love to hear your story. If you want to email it to me at dan at federalprisontime.com. Uh, Cheyenne, here, let's share Cheyenne here. Cheyenne said she would love to be able to share her story. And we love to share stories on here, especially when it's when it's a positive outcome. And what if you've done something that is that is uh, that you can use to share with others. Um, and this is the whole idea of, of people up and people communities method one day at a time. You know, it started off as a little little slogan that I took from RDAP when I was in the program. That's really become to uh, to have value and meaning to to what we do here. Um Vince says he is, let's see what Vince has got going on. Vince says, trying to figure out my prison camp request to the judge between Morgantown and Otisville. Um, I mean, obviously Otisville is where everybody wants to go. Morgantown is not bad at all. I've got clients at Morgantown, got clients at Otisville. I would say, you know, what is your main goal? What are your main purposes? And again, Feel free to uh, to post, uh, send an email, dan at federalprisontime.com or in the comment section, maybe not right here in the live comments, but in the comment of the video, post your question there because other people might have similar questions or some people might have better answers than what you might get from me. So sharing with the community kind of gives you community feedback and some of the advice or uh, ideas you might get, you know, and then you can take it under advisement and do what you think is best for you. What's going on, Sean? Guys, if you haven't, uh, Sean has been a long time follower of the channel. Sean did some prison time as well. Sean has his own YouTube channel, our Club Fed True Stories by Sean Cowgill. So guys, if you haven't done so, go ahead and check out Sean's channel. Most of you probably have. It's uh, It's been growing pretty rapidly. So again, good job on that, Sean. I'm glad to see that you're doing something positive. And I like to I like to know that, that our channel had something to do with you uh, changing your mindset. Sean was definitely in a dark, dark spot before prison. Um, and Sean will share his story if he wants to, but go ahead and check out his channel because he talks all about his demons and what he did to grow through it and where he is now. Um, all right. So yeah, guys, that's really kind of the, the, the purpose of this video is you got to realize that what you're going through right now, is still a very uncertain process. You don't know when you're getting sentenced. You don't necessarily know how much time many of you haven't told you know, your family yet. Maybe you've told some of your family, but if you've got kids, many of you haven't told your children, you haven't told like your, your uh, outskirts of your family, like brothers, sisters, cousins, some of you haven't told your friends. And there's all this anxiety, like what are people going to do when they find out? People are going to judge me. No one's going to be my friend anymore. I can tell you that when you start talking about what it is that you did, you'll be surprised by the level of support that, that you have. I mean, now if you were like the mass shooter at a high school and, you know, that's a little bit different, but for the most of you that are watching this video, I think your own shame is really what's really bothering you is, is you're ashamed that you allowed yourself to make this mistake. You're like, how did I fuck up this bad? Um, and it's okay. You know, get back on the horse, realize that, and you're probably going to make a million more mistakes in the future. That the thing is, is focusing on the consequences and focusing on the healing process. And you can't truly heal until you start to talk about this. And uh, that's one of the biggest reasons why I still do the YouTube channel. Um, we don't need to do the channel anymore. We get plenty of business from past videos. We get consultations booked, you know, every every day we're pretty much booked on our consultation list. I do the videos because it's a reminder of what keeps it fresh in my mind to make sure that I stay centered and stay focused. And if I'm having a bad day, I get on here and make a video and it turns my day around because I see the feedback. I see... Excuse me. I see some of the feedback from some of you and the, and the messages that I get and the private messages and the emails. You know, I've received such heartfelt emails from kids that are talking about how, you know, we're talking young kids, like like teenagers, young teenagers that have come across these videos and sent it to their their parents who are under indictment and how these videos have helped their parents cope with it. And uh, they've seen the changes that it's made within their own family. So knowing that stuff like this can have such an impact 
on just talking about something that was, uh, you know, what I thought was a wrecking ball for my life, which turned into be one of one of the many blessings in life. I know that it can also happen to many of you as well. You just have to find the positive. You know, we all hear the silver lining, you know, well, the silver lining really does exist. I don't care what negative situation you have going on in your life, prison, death in the family, loss of a child, something positive can birth from this. You just have to be willing to accept it and look at it at what it is. Um, it doesn't mean that's going to make your problems go away, but it does mean that uh, as unfair as life is, it's just as unfair for everybody else. You know, life isn't picking on only you. Life picks on everybody when you give it an opportunity to. Most of us that are engaged with the federal government, at some point you open the door and you allow them in. Once you crack that door and they can kind of peek in, it's game over. You've given them now full range. They kick it open, they come in, they can flip your life upside down. And that's where a lot of us go, this isn't fair. I can't believe they're doing this to me. If I had more money, I could fight this. And maybe, maybe not. That doesn't change the reality that you are where you are. You're dealing with what you're dealing with. So how long are you going to keep, uh, you know, dragging ass around and being sad and being mopey about it before you're going to make some change and make some, uh, make some productive outlooks on what you can be doing right now to change your outlook and change your mindset. You know, don't allow yourself to dwell in that land of negativity for too long because it is contagious and you will push away the ones closest to you. Because if you're always in a bad mood, you're always getting upset and you're, you're allowing this to make you moody and you're, you're, yelling at people because you're so frustrated, no one's going to want to be around you. They're almost like, God, when is this guy going to go to prison so I can start reliving my life? You have to show support. You have to show gratitude to the people that are near you right now. Explain to them that you know how hard this is for them to watch you go through this and you appreciate everything they're doing for you. So, you know, give a little back to the people that are surrounding your life right now. Eric Smith says... Hi, Dan. Right, let's let's show Eric's message here. Welcome, Eric. Hi, Dan. I'm on federal pretrial. I have no clue as to what to do to help my situation. I mean, Eric summed it up pretty good right there. You know, it sounds so, I feel like, what's the guy's name from uh, Tool Time? The one that can't look over the fence, Mr. Wilson. That's me right now, Mr. Wilson. Um, Eric, your statement that you just made rings true to probably everybody going through this situation at the same time because... Nobody really knows how to navigate this because there's not like a general map. So Eric, the best thing I can say to you is in the description of this video and here, just in case I know some of us are better at navigating than others. Um, I will post it right here for you. I'm about to post a link that you can grab. And if you want to book a free consultation, talk about your situation a little bit, anything we talk about, Eric or anybody else watching, it's completely confidential. The only time you guys see me share anybody's specific story with names attached is when they've given permission or or they want to share their story in hopes of helping somebody else. So I just dropped the link in the in the live chat that's also in the description of this video for those of you catching this on replay. But book a consultation. It's free. Why not do it? It's a 15-minute consultation. We determine what can happen. Um, a lot of times, these consultations go well over 15 minutes, as some of you know. Uh, so, so yeah, take a look at it. Uh, Terry Howard says, I was sentenced to 97 months to FCI Elkton and just trying to get a feel for the place and the safety level. Safety is not going to be a concern. Um, I believe we have a few clients that have been to Elkton. I think we even have some videos on there. If you want, send me an email, Terry, uh, Dan at federal prison time.com. And I will look for some of the videos that we've done and organize them and maybe send you a couple links of some stuff that you can watch. But prison camps are prison camps for the most part. Um, you're not going to find a whole lot. You know, Some of them are DAP, some of them don't. Depends on what your needs are, what your qualifications are. But if you want, again, use that link that I posted. We can have a consultation as well. We also help people that have already been sentenced. Uh, we help people that are navigating, that want to know more about programs they can take, additional halfway house, some home confinement maybe compassionate release, or maybe you do have a need for RDAP and it wasn't mentioned in your pre-sentence investigation because you didn't talk about it because you were afraid to talk about it. But if you really do have substance abuse issues, whether it was drinking, alcohol, prescription pills, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, drinking yourself into a stupor where, you know, you're unable to drive, you know, functioning alcoholics could be somebody that's drinking, but still functioning and 
not really seeing it as a problem. These are things that could technically qualify as well after the fact, but you might need to get a substance abuse evaluation. Um, honesty is going to be the key to foundation here, guys. So if you want to book a consultation to find out if RDAP is something that you could potentially qualify for without it being in your uh, pre-sentence report, definitely book a consultation on that and we can discuss what's going on there. Uh, Amanda Nelson, uh, my husband is in Morgantown right now. Yeah, we have, uh, we have uh, quite a few of our clients are at Morgantown. Um, just reading some of these questions. So yeah, so guys, you know, it's, it's, this isn't the end of the world. I know it feels like it right now. I know every day is kind of like daunting and every time your phone rings and every time you see a call from your attorney, you feel like your heart stops. Uh, I, I remember because, you know, I lived in Florida most of my pretrial. My case was out of Savannah, Georgia, and I moved back to Florida and the 912 area code was uh, Savannah, Georgia. So every time my phone rang with a 912 area code, it was like tunnel vision took over, the cold sweats, the anxiety, the you know wanting to disappear from the public eye and just kind of go lay in bed and turn on Netflix and disappear into you know into infinite space and pretend like no problems exist. Um, I was right there along with it, guys. You know, I thought of the, the suicidal thoughts and the thought of fleeing and you know, if I could only afford a million dollar attorney to go in there and slay these dragons. Guidelines are guidelines, you know, not to say they can't be adjusted, but the more money you spend doesn't mean you're not going to go to prison. You know, we see a lot of these very wealthy white collar individuals going to prison, doctors and attorneys, and, you know, they think they can buy their way out of it. And the problem is, is there's consultants out there that kind of thrive on this. Consultants out there will, will cater to the white collar individuals because they know the white collar individuals are likely to pay a lot more if they even have an inkling that it can get them out of trouble. Um, now, hiring a consultant 100% can impact and create a better outcome for you. But somebody that's just a nonviolent first time offender versus a, you know, uh, uber wealthy white collar type of an individual. You're facing the same type of situation. You're both probably going to the same type of a prison. You're going to be facing similar guideline ranges. The really the only thing that changes is uh, the very wealthy are, are accustomed to paying to get their way out of issues, while somebody that can't afford that thinks they're going to get the shitty end of the stick because they can't afford it. Well, the feds don't really discriminate too much in that situation. Uh, the guidelines are those guidelines, and you know I can I can show this to you in proof from the clients that we've had that have hired private attorneys to the clients with similar charges that have appointed attorneys, and they end up very similar sentences most of the time. Uh, the problem is, is the difference is, is in the federal system versus like the state system. In the federal side, when you're given a federally appointed attorney, whether it's a you know CJA attorney or just an appointed attorney from, you know, uh, that they give you from the court, these are not like public defenders on the state side. It's not some brand new attorney that just got into the industry and has no idea what he's doing. He's overwhelmed. Private attorneys and appointed attorneys in the federal side, most of the time, they're both private attorneys. Pri some private attorneys just take uh, the federal appointed cases because it's extra money for them and they don't pay bad, but you're usually getting a pretty good attorney most of the time. Many of you think your attorneys are not good because they're not telling you about the personal narratives and they're not answering all of your questions and you get off the phone with more questions and answers. And I wish I could say that there is a, a way to lead to what causes this, but we hear this from the majority of our clients that they feel that they're not getting the level of service from their attorney that they thought they were going to get. Um, I think that's something to do with the expectation. You think when you pay an attorney that they're going to fix everything and it's just going to go away. And that's not the reality. I don't know if the attorney sold it that way or if that's just the illusion you had in your mind, but it's not the reality. There's not as much an attorney can do as you think there would be. They're not going to go in and battle the government. 99% of the time, you're not going to go to trial. Most of the time, your attorney is going to advise you to take a plea deal and they're going to argue against going to trial because you'll probably get your ass handed to you and receive a much lengthier sentence. So as much as it seems like your attorney is working for the government, I hear that so many times that I feel like my attorney is just working with the prosecutors. It's because they know if you go to trial, you're going to lose, you know, especially if you're under like a conspiracy charge or something like that. They know the chances are you're going to lose. And most of the time when you guys hire private attorneys, whatever fee you're paying probably doesn't include a trial fee. It's probably, you know, to plea out your deal. And if it goes to trial, there could be additional funds because who knows what's going to be needed at trial. Expert witnesses, how long is the trial going to go on? Um, so, you know, you're really looking at an upward fight when you're thinking about going to trial. 
Now, if you're completely innocent, you didn't do it, I'm not going to tell you to take a plea deal. I'm not going to tell you to go to trial, but you need to weigh out your options and look at the pros versus the cons and what happens if you go to trial and lose versus what happens if you accept a plea deal. Many of us don't want to accept prison as a reality at all. Three to five years is three to five years too many, where going to trial and losing could be 10, 15, 20 years. You know, you just, it depends on your situation, but you got to allow reality to sink in a little bit and make an educated decision with all of the facts, but don't get blindsided. Uh, let's see if we missed any questions here. Uh, okay. I like to see how you guys are just communicating with each other. That's awesome. Um, and that's what this whole idea is. Oh, don't forget about the Facebook group, guys. I meant to show you that too. So we have a Facebook group that is um, this one here. Let me show you. Share, sharing is caring. So in the description of this video, there's also a link to our uh, white collar prison wives support group, which again, it's not just for prison wives and it's not just for white collar. That was just the nifty name we gave to it to, to rank up on, on Facebook. But any of you that have a friend or a family member that's in prison or getting ready to go to prison that wants to be part of a part of a group where you can share and you can talk openly without the fear of being like judged or maybe you want to talk, you know, and you don't want everybody to know who you are. Um, you can be a part of this group. And in this group, we talk about it's a lot of support. It's what's worked for us and worked for others. Maybe you've got something that a loved one is going through and you want to bounce this idea off of other individuals that have been in a similar situation to you. Uh, the Facebook group is completely free. All you're going to do is send a request and uh, you know answer a couple questions. Only thing we ask you to do in this group is keep it positive, guys. That's it. Keep it positive. Don't go in here and say, oh my God, I can't believe they're serving them bad food. We know. We already know how bad the prison system can be and how unfair and how unjust and how poorly the treatment can be. But complaining about it doesn't really fix anything. And all it does is create more anxiety and more fear. So the idea of this Facebook group is how can we come together and create positive solutions to get through this? What is something uplifting that you can share today that helped you uh, get through your day a little bit better that might help somebody else get through their day a little bit better? That's the point of the group. So the only way you're getting kicked out of this group is, is being mean to somebody, making fun of somebody, you know, baiting somebody into a to a high heated debate that doesn't make sense. Use this as a community process to, to make yourself a better person. You know, Do something better today than what you did yesterday. And if you wanna become part of the group, there's a link in the description. I just posted it all, uh, I think I posted it. Uh, yep, I posted it here. So it, it's, you know, the method, man, community's method. We wanna help everybody as much as we can Unfortunately, there's not enough time in the day. So creating content and groups and websites, this allows people to come and you know help each other. This can run on autopilot. You don't need me in there. You can go in here and talk to each other. And some of you are going to have way better advice or way better scenarios or situations of what you've been through, what you're going through, than what I could give advice on. So use the tools that are out there available to you guys because it can make all of the difference in the world. Cheyenne followed you on Instagram. Awesome. Yeah. On Instagram, not going to lie. My Instagram is, is a little mixed of everything. It's like, you know, kind of looks into my private life. We talk about some, some RDAP stuff in there, but, uh, you know, I'm not some social media guru. That's all about the business. You know, for me, if this becomes all about business, I'm not going to like do anymore because then it becomes political. So I don't want to have to come on here and be extra proper and say all the right things the whole reason this business started was me making videos just to talk about my own experience and what it was like and answering some questions. And it kind of turned into, into this little mini empire that we've created here, but it's because of you guys that it's created to what it is. And it's having this real conversation back and forth. You know, there's no script up here. The only thing that was planned out was the topic. That's the only thing that we just, that I thought about what this video was going to uh, speak on. And it's a lot of these topics come from comments and phone calls from you guys and processes that you're dealing with. And I'm like, hey, this is something that everybody probably should be talking about. Like we're going to be doing another video on Oaks of Justice. Oaks of Justice is that con company out there that was telling people they were going to get them out on home confinement and promising them that they pay $250 application fees and all this stuff. And, you know, there's been lots of stories on them from the, from the media. And these people are still out there trying to take advantage of people like you. So 
you know, combination of sharing stories, what you can do to better your sentence and what, what disasters that you can avoid because there's a lot of individuals out there that are really going to try to attack your fears and knowing that they can really tug at your heartstrings. And if they can find something that you're emotional about and make it sound good, you're willing, a lot of you are willing to throw money, as much money as it takes to make this problem go away. And sometimes that desire to not want to get in trouble or not want to deal with it gets overran and you stop using rational thinking and you start believing everything you hear because it sounds better than what you're dealing with. So you want to believe it's true. Well, sometimes we got to burst that bubble and bring it back down to reality. And at the same time, we got to out some of these idiots that are out there, you know, pushing this propaganda. Well, you guys are having some great messages here. This is why you guys should engage on the Facebook group because then like right now, once the video goes off, you guys are going to stop communicating because the stream is dead. But if you come pop over into the Facebook group, you guys can keep going with your conversations and sharing this in this community can grow and grow and grow. So we can keep up people, communities method. And did I miss anything? Uh, this is very common, what Terry just said. They threatened to charge my wife and take our kids unless I accepted a plea deal. So I did it to save them. Um, and I would say, Terry, of course, you know, that's a situation. But, Terry, were, were you completely innocent or knowing what you know now, were there, were there some things that you could have done different? My guess would be that there was something that took place. Maybe it doesn't deserve prison time, but... Um, taking accountability is is really, really important. And I get it. They were going to charge your wife. We hear we hear that a lot. But usually there are some situations where this is true, but I'm wondering if there are some things that you also could have done different to avoid this. You know, it wasn't like the government just picked you out of a random hat and you were, you know, not on their watch list at all. They just, you know, went through the phone book and said, we're going to come after Terry Howard. Uh, and I'm not I'm not saying that you're not completely innocent either, because I'm sure there's that does happen. But most of the time, when they get us, we were involved to some extent. We just didn't think it could be this bad. Well, guys, that's all I got. Don't forget, join us at 4.30. Don't forget, for those of you that didn't catch up, we're going to be live again at 4.30. And we're going to be talking about this con artist who has been just conning people, conning people while he was in prison, conning people when he's out of prison. And the government keeps letting him go. He was in prison running scams. The prison knew about it. The prosecutor knew about it. We've got all of this guy's information. Charlie Castro Barbero, we did a background check on him. We've got his addresses. We've got his phone numbers. We've got the business he worked for. I get text messages almost every week about this guy for the last couple of years. And I can't believe that this scoundrel, we're going to call him a scoundrel, word of the day, scoundrel, can't believe this scoundrel is still running amok and he hasn't really gotten hit big time yet. This is the type of person that makes the rest of us look bad because he goes into the system, gets out, and still continues to be a POS. Um, and it's not point of sale. That's piece of shit. This guy continues to run a scam, and nobody is stopping this guy. I don't think nobody really knows who he is, and he's not that fucking smart. He just runs these really stupid crimes that don't seem to really get hit that much. So we've actually got video of this guy in jail talking shit that we're going to share on the video at 430. Uh, there's a description in the link of this video for that video uh, to join it live at 430 p.m. Eastern time. So come join us. And if you've been a victim by Charlie Casto Barbero, send Dan an email or a text and we'll do some research on it. And you might become part of our next video on outing. If you've been frauded by anybody, if anybody's out there defrauding you, taking advantage, they're running scams and you know about that, especially if they're taking advantage of, of people going through the system. If you've dealt with some shady prison consultants, share that information with us. We might be able to bring some light to it through the channel. We've got contacts throughout other media outlets as well that we can bring some of these stories to. So, you know, we don't have to sit here and just stand by and do nothing as one voice, we can get some stuff done. But living in our little bubbles and putting our blinders on, you know, that doesn't usually work out too well for the majority. All right, guys, Mardap Dan, Federal Prison Time Consulting, People Having People, Communities Method, one day at a time. Hope you guys all have a great day. Can't wait to talk to you guys at 4.30. Be safe, everybody. Peace.